Today is December 6, 2007. My name is Tina Beard. I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress's Veterans Oral History Project um, with the Plainfield Public Library. Today we are interviewing Alexander Kesich. Mr. Kesich, your name, your birth date, and your place of birth. It's Alexander Kesich. I was born uh, September 27, 1923, in Joliet, Illinois. You fought in? World War II. What was your branch of service? Army. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were born in Joliet. Yeah. Did you, did you grow up in Joliet? No, I grew up in Lockport. What did your parents do for a living? What was your, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had six brothers, two sisters, and my father worked at Texaco. And my mother was a housewife. Before you entered the service, what did you do for a living? Oh, after I left high school, I worked in a, uh, making sailplanes, Frankfurt Sailplane Company. We made two uh, static mo models of 10 place gliders for the Army, and that was 1941 before the war. Uh, and then I, then I worked at a machine shop in Lockwood. A machine shop. You mentioned that you, you went to work there after you graduated from high school. Where did you go to high school? Lockwood High School. Were any of your brothers or your sisters in the military? Did they enlist? I had four brothers. There were four of us from, were in the Army. I, they, they were drafted. Three brothers were. What up? My older brother, Nick, was drafted. George was drafted, I volunteered, and my younger brother did the same thing. He left high school before he graduated, and he got in the Air Force as a, a radio operator. Because in high school, he had taken up Morse code, and he could take five, 15 words a minute, and so they took him, and he was a radio operator on him, and he went to the Pacific. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I was enlisted. I worked at a machine shop in Lockport and one of the men I went to school with was in a working in a machine shop and he was being drafted. So he dared me to go, to go down the draft board with him and sign up and so I did. I said, you have a car? Take me down there and we'll, I'll sign up and I did. Is that why you chose the Army? Well, yeah, they, that's as they put me in a in the uh, uh, draft, you know, the uh, induction center there in the Army. But I tried, while I was in the Army, I tried to go in the Air Force. And for, we were in Fort Custer, and next to Fort Custer was Kellogg Field. And I talked to the lieutenant, and he said, I'll let you go there. And so he gave me a pass, and I went to Kellogg Field, had my physical net. And then I had my uh, written exam, and it turned out I didn't have enough math. So, so they said, well, you can't go in as a pilot. I want to be a pilot. And so I said, well, how about letting me be a gunner? And they said, OK. Well, battalion headquarters got the uh, news from the uh, Kellogg Field, and uh, <laughs> they said, you can't go in there because we're going overseas. The captain called me in the office and he said, how'd you get to Kellogg Field? And I didn't say anything. And the lieutenant was standing there. He said, I let him go. So that's how I got a... <laughs> so it's... When did you enlist? Uh, 6th of January, 1943. And I was, I went in the 13th of January, 1943. That's when you started basic training? A basic training, yeah. Where did you go? Uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. What was a typical day? What time did you get up? What, what did you have to do throughout the day? Just a typical day during well, basic was, training. You get up about six o'clock, then you go have, some, have something to eat, and then you fall out. First you fall out. First thing in the morning you fall out, and, and they count everybody, and then you go and dress and get something to eat. And then you have your different classes, exercise, and uh, judo, we had judo, 
and we had calisthenics, and then we had different things that you know the Army has in identification, identifying different tanks and whatnot, airplanes. While you were stationed, how often did you get to have liberty? How often did you get to go on leave? It didn't, not, not, not basic, basic training. They wouldn't let you go on leave. How long was We that? just maybe went into town, yeah. But that's, that's all. How many weeks was that? Oh, I think it was, well, we went in the 13th of uh, January and the 1st of April, we were uh, going to Fort Custer. And that was it. We didn't, we didn't go out any place else. Just Fort, well, we went to Fort Custer and from Fort Custer, we were let to go into Chicago if we wanted to for three day pass. So I did, went to Chicago and then I went over to Lockport, <laughs> see my parents and went back. Where is Fort Custer? And, and Kansas. And while I was down there, I had, I had German measles. How did they take care of you? What, what did they do? Well, I went to the base. See, we would, every uh, week, we would hike 10 miles three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Wednesday was night. See, we went up, uh, and this one, we were, all the people, the guys were coughing, and I had a cough, I just coughed day and night. And this one uh, night, we got off a 10 mile hike, so I said to this friend from Chicago, I said, ah, tomorrow morning I'm gonna go to sick call. They'll maybe give me a couple of aspirins. But I went to sick call and they checked me over, and uh, the medic said, it gets over there. And I sat down over there, and um, I had German measles. So they put me in isolation ward in the main part of Fort Riley. And I stayed there about 13, week, 13 days, I guess it was. And they tell you what, when I got there, they had, took a shower and had, and had a cot to sleep in. And the nurse said to me, you can't have, can't have you cough in here and keeping everybody awake. I'll give you this medicine. It was a shot glass. And I took that medicine and I stopped coughing. So during the night, in the middle of a week, they, uh, she woke me, a nurse woke me up and said, you're coughing again. This is the last one you get. And I took that other one and I had never had a cold or cough since then. <laughs> and they, they, they have medicine nowadays. But I've never seen that. And one of the friends that worked in the steel mill there, he was in Korea. And he said he had it over there too. And he, he told me what the name of it is, but I forgot what it was. Did you receive any specialized training? Did you have to go for well, go to any other bases after? Well, Fort we Ryan? went to Fort uh, Custer in Michigan and had infantry training, see? And we were classed as uh, uh, military police with infantrymen, see? If they needed us to back up the front lines, we were taken in there, see? And that's what it was. How did they decide that that's what your job was going to be? Did you get to choose or did they assign? They did it themselves. They said, this is it, this is it. And once you were done there, then we you went got your assignment for where you would be overseas? Well, we went to uh, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey and got ready for, for overseas. We were there and got everything all set. Camp Kilmer and uh, we got on as Queen Elizabeth. I think it was 16 or 17,000 troops on there. And that was the biggest ship afloat at that time. And the Normandy, and they wanted the Normandy, but it capsized while they were working on it. It caught on fire, and it was right next to us. And How did you adapt to military life? Was it, was it easy for you, or did you have well, a hard I, time? I was 19 years old, and at that time, it was easy. It was no problem, you know? Explain a little bit, if you can, about what it was like to take the Queen Elizabeth overseas. 
or what it, what go, did it, go over the sea center. What did it What did it look like? What was Was it the first time you had ever been on a ship of that size? Yeah, I, first time I was on a ship, <laughs> and, and it was a huge thing, you know. And we had a, a detail to watch the water dispensers, f fountains, and that. And they were only troops were only allowed to use those certain times a day. And we were posted on these. And it was all right if you didn't watch this. You could see sick rolling. You know. <laughs> and uh, so I would, uh, where I was at, this one post, it was just down the, the runway, the hallway, I say, it was the captain's quarters and also British radio men personnel. And a lot of women were radio men. And, uh, and the rest of the, on the east side was doctors. And, uh, and he, this one told me, one officer told me that, uh, read some book. See, so he gave me a paperback. He said, that'll take care of your motion sickness. And it did. As long as I was reading it, <laughs> it didn't bother me. But we were there, what, from the 27th of uh, May to the 2nd of June. The last day was all right for me. I think, but we hit a big storm near Iceland, and the waves were over the top. As big as that ship was, the waves were over the top of the bow, and we were on a fan, what they call a fan tail. And every time that the ship went down, or no, the bow went down, you could hear propellers real fast. Then they would slow down as they went into the water. <laughs> What happened once you docked? Where where did you? Well, go we from docked there? in Greenwich, Scotland, and uh, that was in North Scotland there. So uh, we had to wait till they get, they get off the ship, see. And you could get off the ship. They were going down, and they had doors in it, and you get onto small uh, ferries, and they took take them to the dock there. Area, and it was trains were pulled up there, and you got on a train. And that's how you went away. But uh, while we were sitting there, uh, in front of us was a British aircraft carrier, and it was taller than we were. <laughs> we would look up at the deck, the flight deck of the, of the and the submarine was going out to sea. A British submarine, it looked like a rowboat <laughs> compared to us. <laughs> where did you, where were you assigned well, once you were Well, we went there? from, from Greenock, we went to uh, Birmingham, England, and then the battalion split up. Our company went to Cardiff, Wales, and where the other ones went, I don't know. They split up. Each company went different places, and then we directed traffic. We guarded at the uh, dock area, you know, ships, and we walked ready regular duty on, you know, like policemen walk, and I walked. There was a, Cardiff, Wales was a place in the, the, dock, the uh, dock area was called Tiger Bay. Now they made two movies of Tiger Bay, one way, way long ago and one after that. It was a rough area and that was the only place, Tiger, uh, Butte Street was that one street we walked on, walked deep, and Canal Street was another one. And that was the only place we wore our firearms. The men wouldn't go down that way. They had these uh, men from the boats, you know. They were civilian, and it was a rough neighborhood. <laughs> and that's how we, we walked down there. How long were you in Cardiff? Well, I, don't, we worked, I worked in Cardiff until about September. And then we moved to Neath. That's west, west of uh, Wales. And our, our, our platoon was a neat. And we did traffic duty and the same thing, walked, beat, and, and we went to uh, different places, different little towns around there and, and directed traffic. While you were there, you mentioned earlier that you never got leave while you were doing basic training, yeah. but what was it like once you were actually stationed in Europe? Did they give you a day off during the week or? Well, and while I was in neat, my brother Nick was in, uh, in the Air Force in England. 
he was in Turley. And I wrote to him, and he where it was at, because he couldn't t say where it was at. Well, I was taking checking the passes of some airmen and asked them what, where was this place at, 106th bomb group. And he told me, so I wrote my brother and said, is that where you're at? He said, yeah, I'll, said, I'll see if I can get a three-day pass, which I did. And I went over there and got to go on a B-17 bomber. And because he, he was in charge of the bomb loading. And they, they, this bomber that I walked on, went on, they were just taking the bombs off because it was bad weather. And they didn't want to leave it on there, leave them on there so long. So they took them out and went to the bomb dump. And if you ever want to see a bunch of bombs, and it was a forest, a pine forest, with the netting over the top, you know? And there was nothing but bombs, row upon row, stacks of bombs. Did you ever get a chance to meet up with your family again while you were stationed, or was this no, the only No, that's time? the last, uh, that's the only time I did. Were you able to communicate easier with him because he was in the service than, say, family back home? No, or was it, it, all? Wasn't, it was just that we were, uh, they ch checked what we wrote, see? And uh, going right, right, right and home was different, see? But uh, two guys in the Army, they watched what you wrote. Did you ever have any of your letters censored? Well, they censored them, but I don't know if they scratched out what was, what was in there. <laughs> when was the first time that you were, that you saw action? When was the first time that you actually came in contact with? Oh, you mean, well, when they bombed in England, they had bombers going over the top of it, but they didn't drop anywhere I was at. But uh, it was the first time I went was in, when I went to Normandy. Talk a little bit about that. When you, once you finally left and well, headed we, to France, we when was that? That was in uh, June of uh, 44. We, uh, we, D plus 17, so we, we went over there. But Southampton, where we boarded a British troop ship, and we boarded at night, well, see, in the, uh, the daytime and the nighttime is different over there and here. <laughs> Shorter at night. So if it's broad daylight, what do you think? But it's at night, see? And we went aboard a ship, and the next morning we woke up and looked out, and we were off the, off the Omaha Beach. See, we were waiting. We had to wait to get off the ship that way on a LS, uh, LSV. <laughs> Landing ship, infra, LSI, LVI, landing ship infantry. What was it like to be standing on Omaha Beach? What was, well, how did it look? Well, when we were waiting there, the sergeant, platoon sergeant, see all the sergeants, platoon sergeants were issued and the officers were issued binoculars. And this platoon sergeant that we had, the third platoon, he let me look, take a look at it. Now, in, and between the, us and the beach was a row of sunken ships for a water break, see? And there were men on there for any aircraft, see? And then we, when we got on, we just went between those ships, see? And got on a beach, and then we went up on top of the beach. To, well, we had to take our socks off to keep our, from getting wet, but we didn't do that. The, the boat coxswain said, I'll drop you off that rock over there. And uh, he dropped the ramp. We jumped on a rock and jumped, missed the water, so we didn't get, <laughs> we had to put our socks back on again. So then we went up the hill and we waited for the rest of the, the uh, men to come out, you know. And then we marched inward. And while we were, when we were marching in there, I said to this one man, take a look, poppies. And that field was like, do we have dandelions here? They had poppies over there. We went in about a, oh, a couple of blocks or something like that. And there was a, a blacktop road that the trucks from the, getting the supplies would come up the hill and come around and then go. And so we stayed there uh, that day and the next. Well, we ate all our rations the first day. 
the second day we didn't have nothing but what they call a D-ration. It was a chocolate bar. And we just broke it up and put it in a canteen cup with water and they had these old Coleman stoves and heated it up and that's what we ate for that one day. The next day we got a, uh, trucks and they took us over near uh, on the west side of Carentan. And we dug in in this uh, field, I call it a field, but it's about an acre square. And uh, there's a road. And uh, we dug in foxholes there. And the next day they, they g gave us blankets. They gave a big ba bale of blankets. And uh, each, each, one, each guy, man got a blanket, that's what we, but other than that, we slept inside the foxhole with our clothes on. <laughs> what was the weather like? It was nice until one day I was on duty guard and I was walking inside the perimeter, you know, and it started to rain. Well, I had a raincoat on and it rained so hard that I even had water in my pockets with the raincoat. <laughs> and luckily we had built a, a, I had a foxhole dug against the hedgerow and then I put branches and there was when the uh, sergeant had, had this bale of uh, blankets, it was covered with plastic. And he said, if you let me sleep on a, in your hole today, tonight, you had to go on guard duty, so I'll give you this plastic. So I put that over the top, of, so it was nice and dry. <laughs> a hedgerow isn't like a standard set of bushes, right? They're, they're bigger, aren't they? Well, it's about this high of dirt. See, it must be hundreds of years ago. They built this up to stop the wind from blowing this topsoil off. See? And in between each end, like there was a spot there that was deeper and up. It was a walkway or what, for carts, wagons and whatnot years ago. They would go up this alleyway. And they used that dirt to build this about this high, about that wide on the bottom, see? And then they planted trees on top of that. And uh, those trees broke the wind. In England, they have the same thing along the coast. They have hedgerows. And that's to hold the wind from blowing the topsoil away. Was it hard to navigate around those? Being in the well, army, was it, was it a challenge because they break up so many fields? Well, we had, I'll tell you what, the, it was, a, I think, the 4th of July because of, across the street we had an artillery battery. And there was a house where we got the water from the pump. And uh, this, uh, the big heavy equipment wasn't come in by the LST. So that was the day they came in. And these guys, are, one man was from Braidwood, and they came in. You know, we were all saying hello and all that, you know. And this artillery battered fire, battery fired one time, all together, and boom. And he took off and he went right through the hedgerow. <laughs> we all laughed at him. He came out through the hole we put in. And, and he, he said, what was that? We said, that was the artillery across the street. So I, later on, I found out what it was. Uh, they were told on 4th of July, all the artillery would fire at one time, a certain time. And that's what it was. Because all those guns fired, boom, and they made a lot of noise. <laughs> what, were, what were your duties? What, you well, mentioned directing we, traffic. What else did you do? Directed traffic. As, as assigned. We directed traffic and guarded. Like down in, in between that hedgerow, down about, well, let's say two blocks, not even that, was a farmhouse. The headquarters of the U.S. Army was there. And also, all the uh, telephone wires were in the barn, came in the barn. They had communications in there, they men. And only one allowed in that place had a tag. And we had a guard in the door and out of the door. So they checked everybody going in there, and that was it, see? And uh, 
we guarded there, and we guarded the, uh, uh, there was another building that had all the officers in it, and we guarded there. What were your shifts? How many hours six on? on, on six on and six off. And when you direct the traffic, it was two men. One was in the hedge row, and one was guarding the traffic, uh, doing the at traffic duty. <laughs> Want another funny one? I was going on traffic duty, and I had, we had flashlights. And on top of the flashlight was a s plastic uh, piece. That was, when you turn it on, it just glowed, see? And I was going on duty, and this one man says, he was from an outfit that was in a hedge row. He said, what's that? I said, he was a tr truck driver. I said, that's, as sure as you could see me at night. And he said, oh, that's what it is. He said, I saw that one day when I was driving and I thought it was a ghost and I turned the truck around. <laughs> Did you find that you worked predominantly days or nights? No, it all yeah. depends on how they, the men, you know, were. It was, if you come on at 6 o'clock in the morning until 6 noon, 6 at night till 6 to midnight, see? And if you were at one, po one sex, Spot, direct in traffic. Then, if you moved, maybe you changed the, the period. See, maybe you started uh, six hours different. See, and it didn't matter. It was six hours, and that was it. When was the first time that you experienced combat? Well, that well, that was. A, see, we were directly in back of the front lines. You could hear the small arms fire. And the f artillery f battery would fire every once in a while. And then across this farmhouse, the 88s would come over and they'd land someplace behind us. And when they did that, well, I don't know, it could have been an airfield because of the P-47s would take off three at a time. And they would shoot toward the lines. And we'd watch them, you know, going around trying to find out where this artillery battery was that was firing. Then it would come back, and they would land one at a time. And they'd go around, and one would drive, and the other fill the three of them. And that was always continued, you know. And at night, there was an observation plane that came around the, over the British sector to the, to the uh, beachhead and around and came over the top of us. And it was low enough that I, you could see the, the pilot and the, the man in back. The motor photographer or whatever it was, gunner too. And I, some years later I drew a picture of this from, from memory. I have it at home. What was the first major engagement that you were a part of, your unit was a part of? Well, we were an engagement, we were just directing traffic in that, see? And the only time we went someplace, we were in Le Mans, France, and the, uh, we had a liaison officer from British, a British liaison officer. He was uh, a major, and he was contacted by the French forces of interior that there were some Germans in a forest south of Le Mans. So they got a bunch of us together, drove us down there, and we went to look couldn't find anybody, so we went back. And then, and then other time was uh, south of Liège, Belgium, during the bulge. They said there was a uh, going to be paratroopers dropping, so they took us south of Le Man, uh, Liège, and we went in the basement of a house, and they said, "Stay here until we need you." And the next day, the, the paratroopers didn't drop. So, tell me a little bit about that winter, the Battle of the Bold. What was it like? Really cold. This is a nice, nothing here. Snow and cold. Uh, what were your provisions? What did you have? How did you stay warm? Well, we had, everything was made of wool. Our uniform was wool, our underwear was wool. You know? And we had a woolen sweater and a beautiful scarf, a woolen scarf. And underneath the helmet, we had a woolen hat. You know, it's all wool over your ears. 
and your coat, and the gloves were all wool, and uh, with overshoes on, and we'd put the paper on our shoes and stick them in the overshoes to keep it warm. <laughs> and we were on that way six hours on and six hours off. What did you do in your off time? Did you just sleep? Well, you, you, you ate and slept. <laughs> See that, and in, in the Liège, they were called it buzz bomb alley. They were say every five minutes a buzz bomb would come over the top. It'd either go into Brussels, drop in, in Liège, or go to London. See, but they always come over. And it was all right if you could, if you were outside and you watched the thing as as it cut off the engine. It was a, a pulse uh, jet engine. And when a jet, you know, fire would come out the back, when that stopped and the noise stopped, then it'd come down. See? But you, you watch where it comes down. But if you were in a building and then you hear, hear the noise stop, you just waited. <laughs> and uh, this one night, it blew up near us and it had these boarded windows, you know. And this one motorcycle driver, it was up near the window, see, and his board came down. It was a big window there. Came down on top of him, and he was in a sleeping bag, plus a blankets. And this fell right on top of him. And he was hollering, get me out of here. Well, what had happened was, when we took this off of him, he had twisted around in the sleeping bag, and a zipper was on his back, so he couldn't get out. <laughs> Was that the closest call you had with no. the buzz bomb? No. Well, closest call when they when they oh shit. We were going. They were trying to move us. There's the highway going to Aachen, Germany, and they said it was too long for us to uh, they take us us to this one place for truck and traffic. So the four of us got in his uh, weapons carrier, and we were going to go there and drop us off there in a house, and then we would just walk from the house into the, and we were in a in a weapons carrier, and this buzz bomb came over the top of the hill, and it came down, and it landed just before the house we were going into, and if we had gone a little bit more in the truck, would have been where that explosion was. Just boom, all the bricks and everything, wood flying. And if you know, we'd have blown this, blown this truck against the wall, uh, in, you know, embankment. And we went into this house and it blew the chimney down and that now. So it, it was so damaged we stayed there one day went back. You were transferred around quite a bit in your duties? Oh yeah, we would go all over. They'd put us all over. Depended on where they wanted us. They had, during the balls, they sent somebody, this uh, friend from Chicago uh, was going to go down s uh, south to this one town, and he couldn't go there. They already occupied it, so he had to come back. <laughs> See, so you, you never know where you were going. Tell me a little bit more about some of the things you had to guard. Well, we guarded, well, we guarded in the, in Normandy, we got it in this building where the officers were. And then, uh, what else? You had a, you had a pipeline. Oh yeah, the pipeline. We, we got a pipeline that ran across northern France and that. We had to walk 10 miles. Each, there was 10 miles uh, apart were pumping stations. And we walked that 10 miles and come back. They would drive us back. And then four hours later, somebody else had gone out. Then we would go down again and say there's a back and forth. Both ways we were going. And uh, why did they make you walk it? Well, they they said that maybe the civilians would go drill a hole in there and steal the gas, <laughs> or if the gas line accidentally broke. But but uh, we never found anything like that. And uh, and it was you know see anything else I. It, what was it like in some of the bigger cities? You visited 
you visited several locations. We were all in Salt City. Only one of Lamans. Lamans was the first big city we went to because, see, when we there were avalanches, they had this. Uh, the Germans had a push, the Felice Gap, and we were south of that. And the sergeant came up to us one day and said, "Get ready because in case the Germans go across the road, break the uh, highway, you know." And you, you'll be stuck down in southern France. So it didn't happen. At night there, it, all you saw was big flashes, just like 4th of July here, artillery going off. And they didn't make it, so we stayed there. And then, then they moved us, and Patton went down into Le Mans and Paris, and we followed right in back of them. And where we went there, there was nobody but us. You couldn't see anybody, no, no GIs, as we were, we came into the east side of Le Mans, and they wouldn't let us into Le, Le, Le Mans. But I found out later on, because south of Le Mans, there was a, the, the French uh, FFI, the French forces of the interior, uh, had hit a bunch of Allied troops, prisoners that escaped, and they were down there. So they wanted to get them out of there, and then they let us in there. And I saw them when I, they let us in the Le Mans, and I was directing traffic right in the middle of town, and these buses came in, and that was what where these prisoners, escaped prisoners were, in these buses. Where did you go from there? Le Mans. You traveled, you traveled west with, with the advancement, is that how it worked? Oh, were east, we were going oh, east. I'm sorry, <laughs> east with the advancement from yeah. the west? Yeah, we went to all these small towns, different things. And then we went north of Paris, and the whole battalion got together there. And that was the 1st of December. And then we all got together and drove to uh, uh, Liège, Belgium. And while we were, were driving through there, I'll tell you, we went through a forest, and you could see the trenches from the First World War. The trees were all small, bigger ones. And that you could see the zigzag trenches. And then there was a cemetery there uh, from the First World War. And when we got to uh, Liège, we, uh, we, we, we didn't stop in Liège. We went further on to the Dutch border. And we stopped there. And uh, the battalion headquarters were in this town. It was just on the border of Holland. And then we moved, our company, big company B, we moved back to uh, Liège. And uh, company A went to uh, Maastricht, Holland. So we directed traffic between there. And then another company was in, uh, no, uh, no, I can't think of the name of the town. And the other one was Amiens, France. So we took, uh, took care of the whole highway. Of the, what was the highway? That, I, that was the, I guess it was the uh, Red Ball Express. <laughs> Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, the Red Ball Express. That was a, traffic was only allowed on uh, army units, and civilians weren't allowed on it. Yeah. Where did it, where did it begin and where did it end? Well, it be began at the Schorberg and came all the way down the fence. Later on, the, the uh, ports that opened up put in traffic and they were shorter, see? And uh, they would go in that way. And uh, What were some of your experiences while you were in Liège? Did you have any close calls there? Well, just big explosions. Well, we had a couple of guys wounded in there. The, the, the building was uh, back at a, a buzz bomb landed back the building, blew the building in and broke this one guy's leg and another guy broke his arm. And, and uh, where I was at, uh, we were, uh, well, you know, they, uh, they call the first floor the ground floor. That's one. Two is the first one above what we call first floor. And we were in the second floor, and then there was a third floor. And they told, the captain said, 
well, we can't keep you up on the third floor. Go down to the second floor. Because if you hit with a buzz bomb, you know, we said, if you get hit with a buzz bomb, what's the difference what floor you're on? <laughs> it was, the top one was just fall down on the rest of them, see? Because we seen them. I seen them. I was wrecked in traffic one day in the middle of the age. And I, was, I had that camera, my 127, and I was always waiting for a quick, uh, easy shot. And this buzz bomb came down. And two blocks was the Muse River. And I waited, and all of a sudden, just boom, and all the debris went up, dust and everything. And we had two men on a bridge there. I said, boy, they must have been pretty close to them. If I wonder where they hurt. Well, they picked us up at 12 o'clock, and they were on a truck. And I said, how close did that buzz bomb come? He said, you should believe it. He said, it came across the river towards us. We laid on a pavement, and when they got to the buildings, it just uh, and went across the opposite side. And he said, it picked us off the pavement about a foot high, the explosion. I said, gee, were you lucky? He said, you kidding. That's, that's a, and I'll tell you another thing. I was at the same poster. Across the street was a signal corps. Two men were in a doorway, and they had a, si uh, air raid sirens. Well, uh, next on the, uh, see the street cars came down, tram cars they call them, came around, around, and then he would, this man, civilian there, was in a, like a telephone booth. He would let them know when he, they could go up the hill toward Aachen, uh, because there's one track, see? So when the air raid siren went, he was gone. And so I was watching, and this plane was bombing this bridge, and I was watching it. And I heard this noise, you know, boom, boom, boom. And I thought the artillery was, the anti-aircraft guns were shooting at me. Then I looked, the, the explosion went a block away from me. One, two, three, and then back. And I said, I bet if you put a string across there, you'd line me up in it. And he must have been shooting at me. Because that one blew up by that telephone, I call it telephone booth, and blew the window out. Shrapnel blew the window out. The other one hit the building in back of me. See, there was just a sidewalk. It was a one-way, one-lane street, you know, and uh, hit the building in back of me there. And the two men in the signal course said, what were you standing there for? I said, I didn't think they were going to shoot at me. <laughs> and that was the closest I, got, I came to. What kind of... How in the loop were you, were you kept being in the Army? Did you know what was going on around Europe? What kind of communication did you have? You just found out from different men what kind was there. They would say, you know, this is happening, that's happening. And when the bulge started, I was in an information booth. And one of the men said that they're counterattacking, see, south of here. So that's how I found that out. And, you, you know, you couldn't find out very much unless somebody, somebody told you, you know. What kind of communication did you have they had a, they had side? What, how did you, did you get letters and send letters while you were overseas with family? Yeah, you could, yeah, you wrote, wrote letters, sent them over, if you had the paper and that, and that to do it. But you were, it was no time to do things like that, you know. You, you got off duty, ate, and went to sleep, see? And there was no time off. And you had to procure, I'm assuming, procure the paper and the pens to write your letter yeah. in the first place? Yeah, they get time and you'd write a letter and, and mail it off and then, and you didn't have to stamp it because it was, it was mailed, I forget what they call it. And uh, you just give it to the clerk and he would mail them. What did your, what kind of provisions did you have? What, what did you carry? What was it, what was it like? What did you? You carry on yourself? Mm -hmm. Just your belt what of ammunition. What did your pack include? We didn't carry a pack on. We only did, did that when we went someplace. 
carry, carry a pack. And uh, uh, you just had your ammunition belt, your whatever you carry. I carried a rifle once, uh, one time till, till I went to Belgium, and then I get a submachine gun, see? And I carry that. Well, I call it a grease gun, a new one they call it a grease gun. It's not like a Thompson submachine. Some had a Thompson, and I got the grease gun. Or we, we named it a grease gun. And uh, we carried that. So you had two pouches of ammunition in the front and the gun. And that's what you carried. Where did you go after you were in Liège? Was that your final stop? Where, no, where did we you were, go as the war progressed? We were in, in Liège. Well, you see, I had an appendix attack when I was wrecked in traffic. Then I went to the 56th General Hospital, and that was in February. Well, after that, it was, the, it was wearing off, you know. And uh, some of the men went to uh, uh, the Ruhr Valley and brought back prisoners. When I was in the hospital, I couldn't do it, see. So when I came back, that they came back then, that they were bringing prisoners back. So I didn't get to go into, directly into Germany. I was on the border, and uh, that was it. Where were you for the end of the war? Well, let's see. I was in Mons, Belgium. No, I take it back. I was in Liège. I was still in Liège. Yeah, because uh, we went to the this citadel in Liège. We were guarding. There was yeah, German prisoners there that did uh, medical work in the hospital. And. Uh, we went to the, went in there and, and we were guarding this, you know, this, this, there was three doors there. We just guarded the doors, that's all. As the prisoners came in, well, they worked and they, you didn't have to worry about those prisoners there. They were, they were too good, they treated me, you know. They wouldn't go off there if you chased them out. <laughs> Because we had some uh, prisoners in Mons, Belgium, that, that worked in the kitchen. We had just a platoon. And they were, they'd come, the Belgian uh, civilians would bring their prisoners in, and they would work in the kitchen. And when the war, that was the war ended, uh, this prisoner said, why don't you take us with you back home? <laughs> we said, we can't do that. Because the cooks that, they cooked everything, and they were good cooks too. And whatever, if we had a party after the war, these guys were in, in it, you know. <laughs> how did you feel about the end of the war? Well, what, was, how did you get the well, news? Well, the, the, the war in Japan didn't, didn't end until August. See, it's well, you, you knew you were going home then, because some of the men went home. See, if they were older and uh, had a lot of time, they could go home, you know. What was the system? How did they decide who was going to stay? How many points you had? How did that work? How many years you had in if you were married? And that was about it, I guess. So how many points? How many, and then being overseas was, was, was more points. Yeah. How many did you have to have in order to qualify? I think it was 70 home? something, something like that. And uh, well, I had it in November. See, in fact, a whole bunch of us did. See, we were going home. What was that like? How did you feel? Well, it was being you told know you what? Could after go home. being there so long, it felt like home. <laughs> it did. You know, you were gone so long, you can't remember what it was, it was like at home, you know, in the States. Tell me a little bit about the friendships that you made. What was it like to be a member of your unit platoon division? Well, with the other GIs? Well, I had a fr good friend of, in Chicago, uh, Cuban, his last name was, and he w was in basic training with me, and he, he was. And there was a couple other ones there. LePage, he was from uh, Massachusetts, and uh, different other ones there. There were, you know, you got to be 
two years or two, oh, more than two years were, and got to be just like brothers, you know. And uh, well, a lot of them there, like when I, when I went to, see, I got married, I was married in, in England, Wales. And uh, it was in uh, August, I left for, for Wales. And when I came back, a lot of men already had gone. We had new replacements in there, see? See, the older ones, they just had enough points that they just left. Did you feel that you missed something by coming back and they were already gone? Or well, you know, you know, know friendship, good, fr you know, good friends, and then they would go on, see? But some, most of them, they were, were the good friends were still with you when you went, when went to La, uh, La Man, well, oh, what's that place, Port there in France. We went to uh, uh, northern France there. Oh, gosh, what time? Anyhow, we went on the Camp, camp Lucky Strike. <laughs> we were there waiting to get, get a ship. So it was August of 1945? Like it was La Havre, yeah. And you went back to England? No. Well, you see, I went. I got married, went to England, and then came back. See. So you were on leave, and then. Then I came back, and we were still in, ba in Mons, Belgium. See. Then we moved. The company headquarters was in Charleroi, uh, Belgium, and so we moved over there, getting all ready. You know, all, the whole company was getting together, and then from there we went to uh, France. And from there, we got on a ship. What was the process? Did you have to come, stay, come back stateside, or did you get to stay in England after you were discharged? No, you, you just went where they took you. <laughs> and uh, we had one, one man, he wanted to get married, a Mary of Belgium girl. So he, he didn't get on a ship. He was down at docks there, and he was going to stay there until he got married. But uh, other than that, we were glad to go. What was the Army's procedure for that? Did, did, they, did they have a problem with you getting married while you were there? Was oh, there no, you, you, had, you had to sign a whole bunch of papers and then waited. And my wife, future wife at that time, had to sign papers. And they had, she had to get approval from the American government to get married, see? And that was a, a real red tape. And she finally got it. And uh, so then she, they gave her the papers and we got married. How did you meet? How did I meet? I was on duty in Cardiff in a dance hall. And I, we, had, we went down, it was a below the theater, the Capitol Theater. And we went down below there just to check at it. And uh, these girls were there, and I was talking to this one, and my wife, future wife, was a f friend of hers, and they were talking, and uh, we said, well, we'll get together, you know? And so we did. And to top it all off, her mother and father were in, the, in New York during the First World War. He was a ship captain, and he represented Garthwaite and Sons Shipping Company. And they would greet ship captains and their wives when they came over from a convoy from World War I. See, they stayed in New York in, uh, in the wintertime and Montreal, Canada in the summertime. See, in fact, her sister, oldest sister was born in New York and her brother was born in Montreal. See, so they knew, they knew New York quite a bit, you know. And, uh, so, you know, and then he, he passed away way in her 20s, and see, so his, her, mo her mother was a widow, and uh, she was, she, you know, understood Americans, you know. So it was, she was real, she was real nice, you know, so. So when the war was over and you were discharged and you came back to the States, how was it for you to adjust to being back to civilian life? Well, it was it was new, <laughs> but it wasn't bad. 
you know, after a while, a few days, and, and I got a job, and that was it. How was it for your wife to adjust to being here? Quite a bit. You know, it was something different. Amer Americans and, and Britain, it's, the language is different, you know. <laughs> the things you say in, in English is different. Mm -hmm. So she, she adjusted. She has a good front. Of this uh, apartment we had was on 3rd Avenue in Joliet. And uh, in fact, the Brown uh, that lives here in Plainfield, uh, his, he lived in the apartment next door. He was really at the, the Brown I really uh, rented the apartment off of from. And uh, so we got, the, you know. How, I think I had a phrase this. How was it to come home? I mean, were, were you treated any differently? Did they do anything special for you? Or did you just kind of go just right back? Just kind of blend in? it in, you know. You know, my brother, two older brothers were discharged before I was, see. And my younger brother was still over in India, see. He was in the Air Force in, uh, in India. He was a radio operator, communications, see. And uh, he was still over there because he went in later on, you know, so he didn't have enough points. But he didn't get over get home until later on in, in the year, see. And uh, so my other brother just, you know, showed me around the different things we did. So What was the one thing you had to do when you got home? What was the one thing that you looked forward to the entire time you were overseas that you had to do once you got back? Was there anything? I don't. I can't think of anything. You know? A special meal or a place you wanted to visit, or no. Well, I visited so many places. If everything was new, <laughs> and these places in Joliet, naturally, the Rialto and all those places there, I saw those. I saw some good movies and and acts in in Rialto for a dollar and fifty cents. You wouldn't see it, what they paid for in those days. I saw Bob Hope. Well, I saw Bob Hope in Cardiff. Go on. Uh, the, uh, this one theater, uh, it was a Capitol Theater there, and it was around the corner. And he was having an act there. And a, this friend of mine, we were walking, just checking, you know, walking around town. and. At the, at the uh, backstage door, it was one of the men from our, my uh, platoon, and he was guarding the door. And so we said to him, how about letting us uh, in and see Bob Hope? So he said, sure. And he opened the door, let us in there. Now, we were from here to that TV there. And Bob Hope, uh, that singer that, what's her name? Oh, I can't think of her name. And the comedian he had with him, oh, it's called so too many things coming out. And they were just standing there, you know, watching her sing. And so were we. And then we went back out the door. <laughs> we never thought about getting an autograph or anything like that. Did you get to see any other USO performances while you were overseas? No, I didn't see any. Uh, no, that, that, that was the only thing we saw was with Bob Hope there. What did you do for the holidays while you were overseas? Not just, you mentioned Fourth of July. What about some of the other, other holidays? We just worked. It was just an ordinary day. In fact, you didn't have, know what day of week it was. If you didn't have a watch on, you wouldn't know what time it was. <laughs> One day went into the next day, you know. Unless somebody told you today is such and such a day, you would, you would, you know, you wouldn't think of it. You were glad you, that day was there and you were seeing it. <laughs> have you remained in contact with any of the men that you served with? I used to have been in contact. In fact, I went down to St. Louis. This one uh, man was in the platoon with me. Uh, he was in St. Louis, he lived in St. Louis. We were going to Arkansas, and we stopped in St. Louis overnight, and I called him up, and so I went to his house, wife and I, the two boys. 
went to his house. And when we came back, we did the same thing. And in Chicago, uh, John Cuban, when he got married, we went to his wedding in Chicago. And uh, that was, and uh, other than that, I, there was all, well, one time I was walking in, in downtown in, uh, Joliet, Chicago Street. And this, two, this man coming toward me was from the company uh, I was in. He was from Chicago. <laughs> I said, well, people, look at who. Once you were out of the service and you readjusted to civilian life, what type of veterans organizations did you join? I didn't join any until I was in Plainfield and joined the post in Plainfield. See, we were working, you know, when you work different times, there's no, you can't go any place, you know. We moved to Plainfield and I worked six days a week and had the two boys and a wife there and there was always something to do, you know. And uh, then I finally got a friend, had a friend that was, we used to go to a football game, see, and I, he, were, he was at the post. And uh, so he said, why don't you join? I said, okay. So I went down there and joined up. Yeah. And then they, then they sort of ripped me into a, being a historian. <laughs> That's a good job, though. I had one big album and it, they took it. And I have another album, all the photographs. I take, Saturday is a Christmas program. I'm taking pictures there. So it's, it's interesting work. How long have you been doing that? Oh, but let me see. I had the first, first album was 2000 to 2006. And I was in there two years, I think two years before that. And then the, this other album is 2007 and I, I have a made up big album, you know. And, uh, and on the front, they had the Amer American Legion, Post 13, G Plainfield, Illinois. Then the, the years of the pictures, of the photographs in there. How did your wartime experiences affect, affect your life? Do you feel that it changed you in any way? No, it made me different, better, I'd <laughs> say. How would, how would you, you say know, that? You, you know, it dips disciplined in the Army, you know. So that's that makes a big difference. Uh, yeah. Of all of the memories that you have of serving overseas, is there one that you can say was your favorite that you enjoyed? No, they all seem to combine together. You know, there's one one wasn't different than the other one. They're all all something new, something that never happened again. And there it was. Have you gone back since? Not into not into France, England. I was back in England, yeah. But I, I never come went to France. I want to go back to Normandy, you know, and that's a place like that. But I, I never got a chance to. I went back there. So I have a cousin in Peterborough, and uh, I went to see him and his family. And uh, that's about it. One question I, I skipped over. Once you returned home, you said you got a job within a couple of days. What did you do? Did you use any of your military training in, in your profession? Or what, what, no, what type worked, of job did you go into? I worked at U.S. Steel, a machine shop. See? I, was, um, I had machinists in high school, and I worked in the the oatmeal mill in Lockport in the machine shop. And then when I came back, I got the machine shop in, in the steel mill. And I worked there, and then I was stayed from there. Where was that? In Joliet. You've answered all of the questions that I have on my list, but what I would like to know from you is is there anything else that 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 you want to share? Anything else that you think? 
the I Army can, provided I can. for you that you think was a valuable lesson? I can't think of anything offhand, no. No. Or any stories that you haven't had a chance to mention yet that you wanted to share? There's a lot of stories that I can't think of right now. <laughs> it's all jumbled up. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what I did. I don't know if I... When I was pulling guard duty on this building, this farm, I call them farmhouse, where the communications headquarters and everything, and one GI came out and we were talking. And he said to me, oh, what's your name? So I told him. And he looked at me. He said, let me see your dog tags. So I pulled them out and showed it to him. He said, just a minute. He went into the building and he came back out with, a, with another guy. He said, this man, his name's Kesich. He's from Milwaukee. And this one here, that's me, is Kesich from Lockport, Illinois. And he showed me his dog tags and I showed him his, my dog tags. Now, about 10, 10 years ago, my youngest son, friend, was on a computer and he looked up all the Kesich names in the United States. There were 60 some. And there was one Kesich in Milwaukee. And the other was, was South Milwaukee, there were women. And that, can you imagine that? Me seeing that man and you call that a coincidence? Did you con try to contact him? No. Well, see, it was it was on and off. You you got you guard duty here, and the next time you were someplace else, eh? And you, I couldn't contact him. I couldn't take his didn't think of taking his ad address and all that. And then I never knew that he was the only <laughs> one in Milwaukee. One last thing, and I hate to allude to something that you mentioned off of the record, but you had mentioned to me about train cars. Trains? In, in yeah. Europe, and about how steam engines were not allowed to In enter. Paris, yeah. I, explain explain. Because that. The, the smoke was bad for the city, was dirty up the city. That's what I was told. And another thing is, the French, you know your telephone poles over here? They're wood because they have a lot of forests over here. Over there, they're made out of concrete. They're all concrete telephone poles. The ties, railroad ties, are steel. It's a cup piece of steel. And lay on top of the gravel, on the, the stones, you know. That's how they are. In England, when I was there visiting there, I, I was on a train south of London, and I looked, and they were laying track with concrete ties. And on TV, I saw some, they were taken off of a car, of a back of a car, a truck, I think. They were some kind of new kind of a ties. They weren't wood. And they had them way before we did. You had mentioned that it might sometimes take days to get on yeah. the trains because you had to switch? Well, they didn't have engines, see? And I was on a, either a, a, a ammunition train or food. See, we guard, guarded them in case somebody stole, stole them, you know? And they would stop to get an engine. Because, you know, the bombs and the tracks were all, the yard, yards were all blown up before that, see? So they had to just put one track. So it was, trains had to wait, see? So you, you couldn't go in, in the Paris. Well, Paris wasn't bombed, so it, it stayed nice. And uh, like uh, different places there, Le Mans, it was, that was pretty good in tracks in Le Mans. But uh, Chartres, that was messed up all. They, they bombed the uh, railroad yards there. It was all messed up there. So we used to, we used to stay there for quite a couple of days sometime. And uh, then we had a hitchhike back. Yeah, we, we'd come hitchhiking and stop to eat dinner 
at King George V in a hotel in London. I mean in Paris. Yeah. Imagine going in there having something to eat with a rifle on your shoulder. Well, there was the GIs uh, put it on, put the transit uh, mess, you know, and they would. And that downstairs they had a movie theater. And above the steps going downstairs, they had a band playing. And while you ate, there was officers on this side, enlisted men on that side. What date were you officially discharged? Camp Grant, Illinois. That's where I went in. That's where I went out. Do you remember when? Thirteenth. It was. A, it's on there. That's it. 17th, 17th of, uh, thirteenth of November, nineteen forty-five. That's a long time ago. <laughs> I'll tell you one, another one. When we took a, a, a ammunition train all the way to Soissons, France. We were on there four or five days, you know. So we got off and stopped in there to tell them that the train was there. And we also asked him, where could we eat and clean up? He said, right along, along the tracks, the, the building they were in, he said, right there's a showers and anything you wanted. She could shave. So we went in there. Now we hadn't shaved her. We went in there, cleaned all up, changed them, different, you know, some clean, clo nice clothes, and went back in there and said, now where do you go to get some eat? He said, who are you? <laughs> we said, we were the ones that, that went to get a shower. <laughs> he said, oh. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how we looked. <laughs> See, so that, So we went, to, went, had a place, there was a, a hospital there. We went to eat in a hospital there. <laughs> there was some funny things. But you know, in Paris we'd get a, a hotel room, you know, we didn't pay, we just to show the papers that we had. And stay there for overnight and he either take a train back, that was free, and, or hitchhike, which was faster get a truck. And hit. I'll tell you one thing what happened. We were on this road several times, you know, coming back to uh, Le, uh, Le Mans. And we hitchhiked on this truck. So we were standing in the back, two and a half ton truck, the four of us standing in the back. And we were going along and it was a hill turn and then across a, a creek, like Lily Cash Creek. And this guy was speeding. And I said, if we don't, if he doesn't slow down, we'll never make that curve up down that river. So I pulled out my whistle. I was the only one that had a whistle. And I blew the whistle, blow, blow. And he slowed down. We made the turn, got across the, the Bailey Bridge, parked, got down there. Got him, he came out of the truck, and an assistant driver was there. He said, who blew, the whi blew that whistle? I said, I did. He said, am I lucky? This guy fell asleep. That's why he was going like mad down that road. That's, that's what you call luck. <laughs> you see that? I said, none of the four, the four of us, and it were all issued whistles. Had, a, had them on a jacket all the time. And I was the only one who had a whistle. Well, we you. couldn't holler at him because of the window. See? So that's another thing. Thank you, you for I see a lot of things like that happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wonder why, but then. Uh, I could tell you some more that happened. But, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll have to save it for another time. Huh? We'll have to save it for another time. Yeah, so I'll tell you about it the next time. Absolutely. You can tell me them all the time.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kesson. Oh. I'm so thrilled that you came down to talk Holy to smoke, us. Holy smokes, you did talk about We did that good, one. an hour and 15. That's really good. That's really good. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs>